always a great time to go out and enjoy the sunshine <laughs> um, and have another espresso. Um, I'm Rathish Klaas Nielsen. I'm Director of Research at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, a research institute at the University of Oxford that has fellowship program for journalists and does research um, around issues confronting journalism across the world uh, today. Um, I've organized this panel uh, with a great set of panelists, um, in my view, and a, a great audience um, on the future of television news because I think it's an issue that has tended to get a little bit lost at conferences like this where we have tended to talk about the challenges facing uh, newspapers and the opportunities presented by digital media and television, though it's been the most important source of news for most people in most countries, has tended to get a little bit lost in these discussions. Um, so to address some of the issues that, um, that, that we think television news uh, face today and that we would want to discuss with, with you and with our panelists, um, we've produced a report at the Institute uh, authored by Richard Sandberg uh, and myself um, uh, called What's Happening to Television News. I have a few hard copies up at this end of the room if anyone wants one after the panel. Uh, it's also available for free download on the Institute website and I've tweeted a link so you can find it quite easily. Um, what we're going to do today is that Richard um, and myself will present some of the key points from the report. Then we'll uh, uh, have the pleasure of having uh, Alison uh, Brodel, uh, who's executive producer of digital content at uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and Ibrahim Halal, who's former director of news at Al Jazeera Arabic and now is um, editorial advisor to the Al Jazeera Network, will respond pr providing a couple of different perspectives on how they see the future of television news. Um, Richard, of course, in addition to being professor of journalism at the University of Cardiff, is also former head of news at BBC, so he brings both a very analytic perspective uh, and a lot of practical experience to this um, topic. So um, in the report, um, what we do is we map key trends and developments in traditional television viewing uh, around uh, news and uh, developments in online video, as well as uh, a range of examples of how different news providers both legacy and startups have responded to these changes in the media environment. Um, what I'm going to do is briefly highlight a couple of the key points about what's going on with consumption, so what's happening with television viewing and with online video, before handing it over to Richard, who will talk about some examples of how different types of news providers are responding to this changing environment. And then we will get a perspective from Allison and from uh, Ibrahim from their uh, different backgrounds. So. What is happening um, to television news? I mean, for a long time, television news was supposed to be different. And for a long time, it was. Television viewing increased in the early 2000s, despite predictions of digital disruption. Um, but there is a real question as to whether this has changed. People have cried wolf for a long time. The fact that wolf did not materialize does not mean that there are not wolves. Um, and television viewing in technologically advanced markets like the US and the UK have consistently declined year on year since 2012. Um, we see uh, development in the bandwidth of uh, internet access that most people have in technologically advanced markets. We see developments in the kind of hardware and software that makes it a better user experience to watch uh, online video. And we see a tremendous development, of course, in supply, both from on-demand providers like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu, but also from important from social media platforms. YouTube, of course, but also now increasingly Facebook and messaging apps like Snapchat. In terms of traditional television viewing, um, if we look back at the period from 2012 onwards in the UK, overall television viewing has declined by 10%. In the US, the decline is 15%. Um, this, these are sort of average annual decreases of three to 4% in viewing time. That may not sound like a lot, but just to sort of give you a point of comparison, that's directly comparable to the declines in print circulation of newspapers in the 2000s. And if you compound three to 4% declines in viewing over 10 years, you get a 25 to 30% decline, which again is exactly what happened to print newspapers from 2000 to 2009. So these are potentially profound changes in terms of the role of television, and with that, the role of television news in our societies. Um, these declines are far more pronounced for younger people. This is not surprising, but it's worth noting that the decline is twice as fast amongst the 18 to 24 demographic. So it's down 20% um, in the UK and 30% in the US. And that means effectively that the reason that the decline in overall television viewing is not higher is because older people watch 
more TV, not only more than young people, but more than they used to, and it masks a general decline, uh, especially among younger people. Um, by now, the impact can be seen very clearly when you look at average age of audience. So uh, the average age of CNN's audience, for example, is higher than the average age of the print audience of the New York Times. The average age of the audience of uh, BBC One in the UK is higher than the average age of the audience of the print edition of the Daily Mail. So television news increasingly reaches a somewhat shrinking, though still very large audience, and importantly an aging audience and has real difficulties with reaching younger people, both with private television news, for profit, and with public service news. Um, in parallel with this, of course, we've seen a boom in online video. Um, in some ways, you could say we live in a golden age of television. We have amazing entertainment, drama, and sports available um, in many ways cheaper than in the past, certainly more conveniently, very often with higher production value. Um, whether you like Game of Thrones or Downton Abbey or whether you like sports, you can see this every day. Uh, we also see a boom in social video with YouTube uh, being a long-standing player in this space, but of course importantly with Facebook in particular, but also messaging apps like Snapchat and microblogging services like Twitter integrating video. So it's clear that video is becoming more and more important for and integral to digital media. The question though is where is news in this development? News was uh, an important part of traditional television. It's far less clear that news has benefited from the growth in online video. News is a very small part of on-demand video viewing. Uh, in the UK, an estimated 32% of all drama viewing is on-demand and time-shifted. It's less than 2% for news. So news so far has not been able to leverage the rise of on-demand video as much as other genres of television content. And with social, again, the statistics in this area are hard to, to compare directly and, and, and sometimes difficult to interpret. But generally, analysts like uh, Tubular Labs in the US estimate that the main beneficiaries of the rise of social video are uh, celebrities, um, entertainment figures, and sports figures, and food brands so far. So there is a real question, even if we live in a golden age of television content in many ways, and digital video and online video clearly is central to that, where is news in this changing environment. Um, I'll hand it over here to Richard who will uh, talk about some of the examples we examine in the report of how different types of news providers are trying to move in this changing space as traditional television viewing declines and online video rises. So Richard, over to you. Uh, Rasmus, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, just to, to reinforce some of what Rasmus said, um, we're not saying that television news is about to collapse or about to disappear. It remains the most important medium for news and information uh, in the world without question. But certainly in developed markets, there are structural changes to viewing, which uh, we believe may well signal that it's going to become undermined and eroded uh, potentially quite rapidly. Uh, Rasmus has run, run through a lot of those figures in terms of um, consumption in particular. So it raises the question of what is the um, appropriate response. Um, and I think there's a, 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 a difference. Obviously, video journalism, if we can cat categorize it that way, is moving online in different ways. Um, I think one of the key questions for us is to say that when um, internet-connected TVs arrive as a mass consumer proposition, what is that likely to do to enhance these structural changes in viewing patterns that Rasmus has run through? In other words, when uh, the smartphone app is on your television in the corner of your living room as well, and you want to know what's happened in the world, are you really going to wait for a bulletin or even wait for the 24-hour news channel wheel to turn, or are you going to go to your news app and find out what you want in the form that you want it when you want it? And so I think viewing you know, is going to change much more fundamentally as technology starts to move through the next generation. So what's the right response in terms of, of online and digital um, uh, video journalism? I think the challenges uh, are different according to what kind of organization that you are. So for uh, traditional broadcasters, there's one set of challenges about how they rethink and, if you like, rewire uh, their organization to provide video journalism online and on mobile. Because what works on a television screen in a landscape format and in a particular kind of production format doesn't work on mobile and doesn't necessarily work online. Uh, and therefore, there's a lot of experimentation has got to go on there. Um, 
if you are in, uh, a, a newspaper brand that's moving rapidly into video, for those of you who are at the online and social um, video session but just before this, uh, Martin Bellum from The Guardian was saying that most of this job now feels as if it's about video. So obviously print titles are, are recognizing that online in the digital world, they have to be about video journalism as well, but they've got to learn a whole lot of new skills and understanding the best use of picture in that, in that environment and in that context. It's very different from their traditional uh, journalistic strengths. And again, you get into the, all the cultural issues about where does video, the video team sit in relation to the news desk, the print team and all the rest of it. All those old arguments that we had 15 years ago about the online team are coming around again in terms of mobile and video as well. And if you're a, a pure digital player, a new digital player, uh, in some ways, of course, you don't have that baggage and you don't have those issues, uh, but you do have the questions about how you differentiate uh, and how you have impact and how you, how you really um, uh, uh, get to be seen and recognized in a very competitive environment like that. So I mean, the obvious um, areas that, that people are experimenting in are around uh, social media and distributed content, and we're seeing in particular, I think AJ Plus uh, in the States is doing extremely well uh, in terms of uh, Facebook and distributed content. Uh, you're seeing um, organizations like the BBC, my old organization, but one or two other big public broadcasters who've been able to make a significant investment are doing pretty well in that in that kind of socially distributed environment. But again, it's about understanding what content works there and what doesn't. So um, uh, 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 volume agnostic video, uh, the text and video, the right combinations, the right lengths, a lot of experimentation uh, needs to go on there. Um, the other side of what used to be called the court's curve, if you like, so you have the kind of update, social, very shareable video at one end, at the other end, you've got long form. Vice have uh, classically, of course, um, uh, made a, a, a name for themselves in doing long, long form video online and have been very successful at it. The kind of long, long journalism movement, I think, is moving more into video, seeing more people doing long form video uh, that works in a particular context. What's gone, of course, is the middle, which is the two minute package. And actually, in a digital environment, there isn't the same appetite for the kind of two minute, two minute 15 classic television news bulletin package that there used to be. And that, of course, is what a lot of television newsrooms are configured and organized uh, to produce. So that's a big challenge for them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we've, you, you've got social and distributed, you've got long form. Live is becoming increasingly important. We've got Meerkat uh, and Periscope, and now, of course, Facebook Live, which in, is really only just uh, launching. Um, but again, I think that's going to be very significant. I mean, in the end, you can conceive of how Facebook Live you could have um, live, live programming and live coverage within Facebook very, very easily. So at the moment, live is principally around big events, big sporting events. Not a lot of cut through elsewhere, but I think Facebook Live, given the scale of Facebook, may well make a big difference, and we're going to see a lot more uh, experimentation around live coverage. And all of this, of course, comes together on mobile, and I think the big mistake that we see some legacy organizations make is to think that mobile is just an adjunct to online or to what else they do, and it isn't. Mobile is almost a new form and a new platform in its own right with its own dynamics, its own requirements, uh, its own business models, uh, uh, and you know some organizations are recognizing that and organizing around that uh, better than others. But it is uh, the question of whether you go for portrait rather than landscape, duration of the video, combination of video and text and the way it works on mobile is very different to the way it's going to work in a, in a social platform uh, and online and elsewhere. So there's a lot of experimentation from organizations. There's no one recipe in any of those areas that you would say, that's it, they've got it, this is how it's going to work going forward. Um, and I think, again, that's a big challenge, particularly for legacy organizations who are not used to being able to uh, iterate, learn, get it wrong, relaunch again, and have that model that tech companies are you know, far more comfortable with. If you're a public service broadcaster or if you're the New York Times or something, you're used to developing something, getting it right, and launching it perfectly. And that, frankly, there isn't the space or the time to do that. So we're going to have to get used to a lot more experimentation. Uh, and one of the big challenges is going to be how experiments that work are then brought into the heart and the center of what um, newsrooms do. And then finally, underlying all of that, I think, the real challenge is about purpose, because television news and television journalism, which you know is something I've spent 30, more than 30 years doing and feel very passionately about, uh, has had a very privileged position in a low choice context. You know, basically, television journalism has become the most important platform for news and information because 
the limited broadcast spectrum, mass audience and the power of it. Now it's working in a very different environment with a very high choice uh, and it's losing that privileged position and therefore it opens up its, the question of what is its purposes? What is it there to do in a very different news and information environment? And that really is um, quite a difficult thing to work out. And one of the reasons why I'm quite interested in having this debate and raising this debate and stirring it up is because what I see is a lot of what television news um, broadcasters take for granted in terms of their proposition getting eroded from below. So the formats, the studios, the styles of packaging, uh, the approaches to journalism, I think are getting eroded very rapidly because of these changes that we're seeing. I'm not sure that all TV news broadcasters have sufficiently recognized that. So the answer is it's going to have to be a lot more scrappy, dirty experimentation uh, and relearning what the whole purpose of video journalism is in a new environment. Thank you very much, Richard. Alison, are you a dirty, scrappy <laughs> experimenter? <laughs> Well, thank you for that. I was hoping, actually, that uh, Richard was just going to tell me what the purpose of TV <laughs> news was, and then I could just take that back and, and learn from it. Um, thank you, uh, Rasmus. Um, I, I can tell you it from my experience in the trenches. Uh, so I'm, I'm in digital content now, but I have spent the last 10 years uh, in radio and specifically in local television news uh, content production in Vancouver uh, in Canada. And I can tell you from my perspective, the past 10 years have not been a golden age of television news uh, uh, on the shop floor, in the trenches, out in the field. Um, for us, it's been, uh, it's been a battle. Uh, we can see that our slice of the local television pie has ebbed and flowed a little bit. We, we watch the numbers every single day. Um, but we can also see that the pie the overall number of people watching television news at six o'clock, for example, has shrunk in half over the last 10 years. So in the Vancouver market, it's gone from an available audience of about a million to now the same players are fighting over about 500,000 viewers uh, on, a, on a typical weeknight at six o'clock. Um, and so as that battle has been waged, uh, we at the, at the CBC, the public broadcaster, uh, have tried everything. <laughs> we were given a current affairs format where we incorporated interviews and commentary. Uh, we decided that wasn't working and we brought in expensive consultants from the states who, uh, who advise eyewitness news stations and suddenly we were live everywhere whether it was warranted or not we were doing weather every five minutes um, we were doing whatever we could to to try to regain audience share um, and that hasn't been fun either I can I can tell you that because pie is shrinking and really even if we made small gains it it wasn't getting us uh, a lot more audience um, the difficulty uh, and, the, and one of the reasons that we are fighting so hard to stay relevant in the, in the TV news market uh, is a few reasons. Um, one of them is we are heavily invested in television news. And I think anyone here who works in television news knows that it's not cheap to produce in terms of the number of people, in terms of the equipment, the satellite trucks, the microwave trucks, the all the gear that you need to do good television news, um, you end up pouring a lot of money into that. And so I, I think the idea uh, that once we saw the trend going down, that we would just walk away from it and just say, we're just gonna be digital, um, that would have been uh, very costly. And the other reason as a public broadcaster is that we're mandated to do television news. So we don't have the option of saying, see ya, we're just, we're just gonna go online now. Um, so we will continue to do television news. We are currently going through another renewal process, uh, and so we'll see what the format looks like, and we'll see if it uh, resonates with, with the audiences. Um, in terms of uh, the, the challenges of the change and, and how we're adapting to them, uh, we, as, uh, as Richard was suggesting, we are one of those legacy broadcasters that come with a lot of baggage um, and so what we did at first was we just put TV packages on the website and 
then wondered why nobody was watching them. So we have progressed since then. Uh, we struggle with having the technological agility that some smaller, newer companies have. Um, we, we're still not there yet. Um, but we do have a lot of opportunities. Um, so I'll just wrap up by talking, by talking about those and, and where I think we have a lot of promise and, and, and where we're doing well. Um, we employ some of the best videographers in the business, um, as do most television stations, as do most public broadcasters around the world. Um, it, and I think that although everybody else is suddenly experimenting with video and hiring videographers, I still feel really confident in the skill set and the quality of work uh, that our videographers produce. Um, we have uh, taken cues from AJ Plus and others who have experimenting, started experimenting with text on video. We are doing a lot of work on that front right now um, across the country. And in, in fact, this, this to me is the, the next vanguard of where video storytelling is going. The opportunity uh, in those short packages uh, to uh, quickly tell a story and convey meaning in a way that somebody can easily consume on their, on their smartphone. I think we also have an advantage in, in some of our personalities uh, who are well known for their TV work, our anchors and our reporters, um, but the answer isn't to just put them on the web and have them talk on the web. Uh, th the answer is to uh, get them writing, to get them writing analysis pieces, to get them uh, sending dispatches from the field in a text form uh, that we can build on, we can build on the personalities that we already have. And I think uh, Richard referred to long-form documentary, which is still uh, part of what CBC National Television News does uh, really, really well. Uh, and I think uh, that continuing to excel in documentary production uh, it is something that's going to make us uh, distinctive, um, but also resilient to the changes. And the, the final one is uh, live event coverage. We, we can still see spikes in our, our numbers when a big ev event happens, uh, whether it's internationally or uh, for us, we had um, terrorist-related shootings in Ottawa. And the, the numbers of people watching our live television broadcast uh, of the coverage of that were just as astounding compared to the overall trend. So. I, I think if, we, um, if we're strategic uh, and more specific about where we put our money uh, and how we direct our resources, I, d I do think there's a future for, for television news. Um, I think it has to converge with the web. I think it has to, um, it has to be smart about that. Um, and I think it's not gonna happen tomorrow. <laughs> it's gonna be a slow process. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, Ibrahim, over to you. Thank you very much for having me around this uh, professional group. And uh, let me start quickly before I go through my, my short presentation to thank Richard specifically who invited me last year to think about this future of TV notion. And uh, since that time, since we started to write something about it from the Middle East perspective, I'm puzzled about what, what is the reason for the decline of TV news audience? What is, are we uh, dying really? although the need for news, especially in the Middle East, is still high. Uh, sometimes I think that we are providing supply more than demand, that we have more TV, more journalism, more journalists, or those who claim to be journalists, more than the, what we really need as audience. And a uh, few weeks ago, I was fixing my car, and the, the engineer was so proud to tell me that he was, he, last time he watched news when Mubarak was taken away. He was so proud to tell me, that he was so happy. And it, it's a trend now, maybe uh, not only in, the, on, only in the Middle East, it's a trend that you meet someone, a lawyer, a doctor, or someone who's out of your profession, and he's so proud to tell you, ah, you are working in news, I'm sorry, I'm not following. Uh, this is something I'm really puzzled, I'm really puzzled why, and since last year I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, let me start my presentation, which is, please let me know if it doesn't make any sense, because I'm, 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 I'm taking a different perspective. It's not from the Middle East perspective, from, not from Al Jazeera perspective, it's from what I noticed 
since last year trying to, uh, to understand why you are not interested more and more about news and specifically TV news. Although people are ready to watch two hours of football between Real Madrid and Barcelona, they are ready to watch Spectre movie for two hours, although the, the review is not that good, but they are not ready to watch 25 minutes of news. I don't know, I'm telling you, I will tell you gradually why from my perspective, and please let me know if it doesn't make sense to you. Please. Uh, I tried to analyze what uh, the, the, the environment, the environment we are living in, we have technology, we have audience, and we have the product content. And in the middle, we, a journalist, we are puzzled what to do with technology, what to do with audience, and how to uh, develop our content. So I will start in the few minutes, next few minutes, to talk about these three elements. What happened to technology, and what happened to audience, and what happened to our content? And then, what happened to the industry? Technology, for the last five years, I, be, I bet you, is there anyone here doesn't have a smartphone? Anyone doesn't have a smartphone? Please, let me recognize. No, nobody. So everybody has got a smartphone. Five years ago, maybe nobody has got a smartphone. Anyone doesn't have, an, uh, anyone doesn't have a fiber optic Wi-Fi at home? Five years ago, we were very proud to have ADSL what we called ADSL was, so I have a DSL line. And we were proud in our bureaus, Al Jazeera bureaus, to provide a DSL line. Now it's satellite internet. So, and now the 2G is obsolete. No one has got a 2G phone. Everyone has got 3G, 4G, LTE, and etc. And the desktop, anyone is using a desktop? Only in our newsrooms we are so, because we have this legacy, I think our, we are just, we are sad. We don't want to get rid of it but I'm sure we will get rid of the desktop very soon. So all the previous developments happened in technology only, only in the five, last five years. Imagine how rapid, but what happened to people, normal people, I'm not talking about audience specifically, I'm talking about us, even us, we have this impact on our lifestyle. What changed in our lifestyle? My presentation will tell you something, and please again let me know if it doesn't make sense that we are living in the golden era of smartphone. And the smartphone, for me, is the enemy of TV news, although it can be a friend. But it is the real enemy, not only of TV news, it's the enemy of everything we used to live. It's the enemy of our lifestyle. This is what we live to. I have been lucky enough to uh, work in the BBC 22 years ago. Uh, I, w I, I left my country, Egypt. I, I was really happy to see people reading books and newspapers in the tube. But now this is a picture. You have people only working on their, or playing, or whatever, on their smartphone. This is a picture we have now. Even two lovers walking together, they are playing with their smartphone. And now we have this kind of new invention. You have a smartphone, you have a texting, texting lane. And this one is in China, and the, the other one in Belgium. You have a texting lane for people to continue using their smartphones while they are walking. Let alone the amount of, unfortunately, the amount of accident you see on, on, on the roads because people used to continue texting and playing with their smartphones while driving. So what we are doing with smartphones? We are doing everything, starting from selfie, going to uh, booking hotels, flights, gaming, social media, internet browsing, everything. I don't know, and of course shopping now and using it to buy without even getting a, a penny from your pocket. So smartphone is taking over our life. I got some uh, quick uh, surveys, very recent. This is from USA, Flurry Mobile Study. It says that in 2015, I'm sure in 2016 it's now more. In 2015, average American person spending 220 minutes, which is about three hours and more, every day with the smartphone. 90% of this 220 minutes only on apps and 10% on internet browsing. Where we are, where is the news? News is between browsing and a little bit of apps. In the study in Flurry in Fleur study, they recognize only 2% of this 220 minutes on news, only 2%. Okay, let's go to UK quickly. UK, this is eMarketer, it's a very credible uh, research center, 
They think in 2017, they predicted, it will, for the first time in UK, in 2017, the mobile time will exceed the TV time. You can see the difference. TV is now three, min three hours and min eight minutes this year, two hours, 50 minutes for mobile phone. But next year, they predict it will be more. Okay, this is the situation in UK, comparison between TV and mobile. You see how mobile is taken over the TV, not the TV news, taken over the TV. China, you have a similar situation. In China, half of population, they have smartphones, and they spend two hours and 46 minutes a day on their smartphones. India, half a population, and again, they spend three hours and 17 minutes. So these are the main examples I brought. I didn't bring anything from Middle East because there is no credible research. I, I, I believe the situation in Europe, situation in Canada is not so different. This is the average. A person in the West or East spend 188 minutes per day on the mobile phone, which is 60% of the working time. If you calculate working time, excluding the holidays, excluding the weekends, I just put the time with the mobile against the time of work, 60% of the time you spend at work, you spend equally to 6% with your mobile. 40% of your spare time. If you get away the sleeping time and working times, you have only few hours in your day, you spend 40% of your free time on your phone. Have you ever spent 40% of your time with your kids or your wife or with anybody? With your phone, you spend 40% of your time. It will be more and more when we have the LTE and what we call the, the, the Li-Fi. Li-Fi will make our life more connected to the mobile phones. Bottom line, quickly after this shocking, maybe not shocking, I don't know, shocking figures after this, what happened to the data? What happened to our industry? What happened to our content? I believe our content, because of this revolution, which only happened in the last five years, there is a confusion between what people here, even in the newsroom, what we call information, which is data, pure data we get from your mobile, we get from internet, which is nothing to do with news. We provide something else, we provide knowledge. But people believe they have news because they have data. They don't have news because they don't have knowledge. And there is a confusion between they have, what they have from your, from your social media, which is opinions, and what we use to provide, which is facts. And there is a confusion between you used to get from your mobile phones, which is campaigning journalism, and the real journalism we used to provide and we still provide on, on our TV sets. And the last confusion, which is even in some professional places, between amateur video and professional news packages. Because people think they have video about an accident or about something. They have data, they have information. What they have is just data, opinion, campaigning, and amateur video. We provide the other side. But why people don't watch us, although we provide the professional side? Because they have the other side, because they have the data, because they have the campaigning. So what is wrong with us? Because we are predictable. This is my my reading through everything I tried to, to read and to, to ask people for a year now, why we are not watched, simply because we are predictable. Everyone here doesn't agree, d does agree with me that you can sit in front of a TV for two hours watching a football match. If you are a fan of football, you can even stand more than two matches a day. Because it's not predictable, because there's a thrill behind it. We used, we, we lost the thrill. I believe we produce predictable news because in the West, and please, I open discussion about it. In the West, it is so predictable. It's a consistent, it's a coherent society. Everything is systematic and you expect what will happen tomorrow. You hear about a scandal and you will know what will happen tomorrow because of systematic society. In our Middle East chaos situation, you expect nothing wrong, nothing right will happen. So we have depressed people. And we have the engineer of my car who was so proud to tell me he only watched news when Mubarak was taken away and the one before that when Saddam was taken away. So he gave me a shocking fact that he watched news twice in the last 10 years. So we have on-demand movies, we have live shows, but we don't have news 
as thrilling as equal. What can we do? What can we do to do it? Thank, thanks to my colleagues who mentioned AG Plus, this is what we believe the solution, to provide something quick, unpredictable, and I'm asking, it, it's not that successful, to be honest, it should be successful more. We invested a lot in AG Plus, in Al Jazeera, and we, in, Al Je in AG Plus Arabic, still, it's not that strong. Uh, in YouTube channel, it has only 190,000 fan. Uh, some facts about what we have in Al Jazeera will tell you there is an, an, an entrenched problem. There is a deep problem. Only 6% of our video viewers on YouTube are coming through Al Jazeera dedicated channel YouTube. The rest of viewers on YouTube are coming through referrer, which means from social media. So they don't come specifically to Al Jazeera YouTube. They go by chance. The, the issue with depending on social media to bring more audience is, as I discussed with one of our colleagues here during we, our trip on the bus, that you are campaigning for your competitors equally you are campaigning to you. You are telling your audience, please follow my Facebook and Twitter and Instagram page, and they do so through having everybody else in the same page. So I watch Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya and Sky and everything on my Facebook because you triggered me to go to, to, go to do it. The, the solution from my point of view, just to end with, is we need to do a few things. First and most important, to avoid the trap. The trap of social media, the trap of video online, the trap of quick without context, the trap which doesn't have any journalistic standard. We should fight for our journalistic standard. Even if it doesn't pay back immediately, it will pay back in the long term. If we stop thinking of journalism standard, whether it comes to, whether it is ethical, editorial, or even the TV standard, we will lose the battle very quickly. TV journalism should continue. It will continue because it will have need, but the format is different. My predictability is we will see the end of TV news bulletin, but we will have to think collectively, creatively, how to convince audience to create their own tailored news bulletin through IPTV, through on-demand video, through on, uh, uh, mobile application. Everyone should have a presenter telling him, good morning, Ibrahim, this is news for you. Not literally, but he should, everyone should feel that this news is tailored for him or for her. Tailored because they, they know your, your preferences, your location, your needs, and it's tailored on your demand if it is five, 10, 15 minutes. I know there are some labs in Google and BBC and C they do it. They think of a tailored news, like you have your own face telling you what you need. This is the future. Our profession will not die, but we have to be more creative and most importantly, stick to ethics. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Ibrahim. I've asked the organizers to lock the door at the back of the room um, because the, the panel is called the future of television news and we're not gonna leave this room till we know what the future of television news is. Um, but before, before someone sort of stands up and gives us the gospel on that, we will have time for some questions or comments so you don't have to sort of nail it. Um, so if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll call on people. There will be people with mics. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Thank you. Um, to Mr. Brahim, and we worked together for years, and, uh, and do you think that now we are paying back in this battle between the social media and new media and the, the professional journalism in, in TV that because we little bit were far from the citizen, from the community, from people, I do remember, and you remember, that I wrote you 10,000 email that some uh, colleagues in some places in, in, uh, in uh, Arab region that always the, the news package, it was someone from the government, someone from opposition, and professor. So from 35 years old till under, they are out of screen. We, don't, we wasn't in touch with them, where, with their mentality, with their hopes, with their problems, with their things. What, what do you think? 
I agree with you. I cannot disagree. But the issue is there is another issue I don't have time to, to discuss, and maybe everyone here knows the competition. Competition is killing us, not only in the Middle East and the West. I know some friends in BBC and CNN and IPTV, they just keep watching each other, and they are worried about each other and worried about the other uh, channel uh, news running order without thinking of the audience because they think audience will just follow. That's why, luckily, in Al Jazeera English, we started to invent this logo, setting the news agenda. We started this 10 years ago. Hopefully, they didn't let it down because we decided we have no problem with competition. We can start with Burundi, we can start with Somalia, we don't care about other competitors. This is what we need to think creatively, how to be n unpredictable. Uh, hello, Salam Khudur from Flair, and the question also to Mr. Hilal. Uh, you and Mr. Sambrook both uh, brought up the issue of AJ+. AJ+, is not basically a a serious news. It's short, it's uh, very not non-specific. But what the problem is that um, a huge channels like Al Jazeera or any other channel, they started promoting the social media, mediums. And use Facebook, go to our Twitter, that's killing the news industry. What do you think? Shall I, shall I have a go? Um, uh, so that's what I mean really about uh, purpose. So, um, you know, in the 1960s, television news um, uh, in, in the West had a purpose. A lot of it was publicly funded. Even in the uh, America, it was a very commercial market. You had to offer public interest news to get a broadcast license. It was kind of part of the deal. Now that's long gone. So people have to rethink what's the purpose. Is the purpose to make money? Is the purpose just to get a lot of shares and a lot of viewers? Is the purpose to provide in serious information that will help people make choices about their lives and be better informed? And in, what, in which case, what does that look like in a digital environment? And I think that's quite tough. I think if you just want a lot of views and a, and a lot of clicks, you kind of know what you can, you know, you can have a listicle or you can do all sorts of things. You know, if you want to make money, it's harder, but there are certainly ways that you can, you can just make money. What serious public interest journalism looks like in distributed content on a mobile screen is quite hard. So AJ Plus is a great example of building an audience, of finding new formats, breaking new formats in terms of short online video, very shareable. So like BuzzFeed, you know, primary metric is how many times has this been shared? So simply get it out there and drive reach and reach is not a bad metric to have, but is that what your purpose is? Is your purpose reach, or is it public information, or is it making a profit? And what does that purpose look like on a mobile screen or in distributed content in Facebook? And that's what people are having to rethink. And I think for if you're the New York Times, or the Guardian, or the BBC, or even CNN, that's quite hard to work that out, given the position that you've come from. Is there a question here at the front, a gentleman in the front? Repubblica IT. Um, volevo sapere se um, avevate mai fatto, prego, se avete mai fatto degli studi. Vi ringrazio della, della, della pazienza. Volevo sapere se avevate fatto mai degli studi sulla anche cattiva qualità dell'ascolto, dell nel senso che molte volte, almeno in Italia, si assiste ai programmi televisivi compresi quelli di informazione con il cellulare acceso mentre si aggiorna una pagina Facebook mentre si interagisce con i social quindi con una ulteriore diciamo perdita di attenzione rispetto al manufatto <coughs> giornalistico e volevo sapere se avete fatto degli studi in materia e se pensavate di fare anche delle proposte dove c'era un predominio più di testo che di immagine 
Um, uh, there's, there certainly is research on the growth of what's called second screen viewing, so people who have their mobiles or, or tablets or something while they're watching TV, and, and undoubtedly there is quite a big growth. But, you know, people have always done other things while they've watched TV. They've cooked dinner, they've sat down with the kids, they've done, you know, they've, well, people have always done other things <laughs> while they're watching TV, much as me, we might wish that they were sitting there concentrating on our beautifully crafted product. That's very seldom been the case. So I, I'm not aware of particular research into, you know, attention on um, TV news or something like that, though I, I suspect there probably is some. Um, but I think the idea of second screen viewing is, is a, a growing one. And, and actually, we need to look at what, why people choose to do that and, and where the opportunities are for that as um, news organisations and as broadcasters. And some of that is about... Uh, community and interactivity and chat and did you, you know talking to their friends at the same time as they're watching the news and what did you think about what the prime minister said then isn't you know isn't he an idiot and all that stuff goes on in parallel with watching uh, the program and actually I'm not sure that's necessarily a bad thing so um, you know that that phenomenon is growing there's certainly some research uh, on that as a as a phenomenon but I do think we should we should not think that there was ever a time when people just sat down and watched and, and weren't distracted and doing 20 other things at the same time because I think they nearly always were. Just very briefly to follow up on that, um, I mean, as Richard sort of uh, alludes to, it isn't necessarily a problem for television if it becomes a second screen to a primary activity. I mean, we can think about radio, which for 50 years has been a medium that primarily was used while people were doing something else. And actually, that has given it incredible resilience when many people for half a century predicted that radio would become obsolete. Then when you think about how that merges with digital media, um, um, the British uh, media regulator Ofcom makes a distinction between what they call um, stacking use, where you do other things while watching TV, so that's the situation you describe. Um, or in what they call meshing use, where you do things with digital media that is directly connected to what you are watching on television. Um, I think the important thing from a producer's point of view is to accept that not everything you do can be meshing, but that it works for certain things. And Alison highlighted uh, live news events, for example. Uh, it, another area where this has been very popular is not specifically in the area of news, but another form of compelling television is sports. And, and talent shows, which are, th are e genres in which good producers have made digital an integral part of the experience of watching television content. So I think there are some interesting initiatives here. It doesn't work for everything, that's clear. It doesn't work for everything. Maybe it shouldn't. Not everything merits our full attention, frankly. Can I just, um, just j jump in, uh, just to address something from earlier about um, how we're drawing our own audiences away by focusing on Facebook and, and social media. And I, I don't necessarily uh, agree with that. I, I, th I think you can have people come to you in different ways. Um, and the example I, I, I give is um, a TV producer had, had produced this long documentary. It was uh, a 45 minute documentary um, and was told that they needed to provide a 45 second clip or version of it or text or on video of it to push out on Facebook that would also link back to the full documentary if people wanted that. Um, and they were really struggling with wrapping their head around the fact that some people would only see that 45 second version of their beautifully decorated house. Some people would only come into the foyer of the house. And they, they struggle with that, but, but I think we have to be okay with that, that some people are gonna access CBC News only by coming into the foyer. Of course, I hope that one day, if, if not through that doorway, through another doorway, because they know our brand, they will come and watch that documentary and they will watch some of our TV newscasts. But if they don't, if that's their only exposure, then I still feel like as a public broadcaster, I'm doing my job because I'm reaching that, I'm reaching that audience who wouldn't have come to watch the documentary anyway. A question at the far back, the gentleman in the uh, dark gray t-shirt. Hi, I'm Giacomo Canelli. I'm working for uh, Fremantle Media uh, Italia. And um, I want to ask you one question about um, some, I mean, they, they, they've been doing some experience and with TV 
uh, they like launching a TV show on Facebook before on TV and see what happens. And sometimes it, what, what they found out is that people will, uh, I mean, more people will come on TV than they came on, on Facebook. So it was kind of a um, ping pong of uh, audiences, different audiences. They came from Facebook to the TV. Uh, what do you think about it? And uh, if you want to, if, if you have a comment about the fact that Facebook, uh, it's a two days ago news, uh, has become to pay media company to use their live video Facebook, what do you think about it? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to leave you to say that yourself. Um, I mean, I think it's very clear right now that part of the rise of online video right now is supply driven. That, that a lot of big uh, companies coming out of the technology and digital sector, uh, Amazon, Google, Netflix, and Facebook, are of the view that the future of the internet is video. And that they want to integrate video in the experience of using their various services, and that they recognize that their own record of, of generating content that is compelling enough is mixed. So there is a real, right now, I think a real premium on getting good video on those platforms. We see that with YouTube, with uh, YouTube Red, that are paying some creators. We see it with the revenue sharing agreements. We see it with Facebook now, this new initiative. We see it with Twitter acquiring the rights to broadcast, if I can use that word, to stream uh, NFL Thursday night football games in the US. That's a big deal. Um, I wonder about the um, some of the strategy issues that have been raised by, by some of the panelists but also in some of the questions about what's the balance of power, if you will, between the platforms and the providers. And once uh, Facebook has accustomed us to seeing video as an integral part of that experience, if that is the way it works out, um, will the, the content producers need and desire to be in that platform be so great that they can't command a price for the content? Ibrahim, you had a view <coughs> on this. Can I just add something? I, I, I I have a problem with Facebook for two professional reasons, nothing to do with my personal feelings. That the first one, that when you scroll down, by luck, you just have the videos playing, and you as organization, you have wrong figures about how many times your video has been played. Actually, no one watched your video, but just when you scroll up and down, some videos are playing, and you got the figures. So this is the first thing. Uh, second thing, I don't know who's, who's who. Actually, I, I know that there are nine million fans for what page of Al Jazeera, but when you go down deep, which one is what? You found out that thousands of them are fake people. They are not real people. They are just fans by secu uh, Maybe it's just Middle East issue that I know for sure security services in the Middle East recruited people to open hundreds of pages and work. This is their shift. They have a night shift on Facebook just to do some comments like and hate and, and, and trigger things. So I'm not having actual access to real viewers through Facebook. These are too professional, and I address them to Facebook. I need them to come here and to answer why they are giving us fake things. Um, we have uh, only five minutes left, so we'll take two qu short questions at the front here. There are two gentlemen who have been very patient, so if we can get a mic to the front of the room. Um, if you can ask the questions without the mic then, please. As a newspaper person turned multimedia years ago, uh, it, it sounds like you know speaking about the future of TV news is more or less like speaking about the future of newspapers. I mean, are, do we need? Do you? I mean, as TV people, need to talk about the future of TV news, or shouldn't we be thinking more about again multimedia? If you know the personalized. A uh, package of some kind you were talking about. It could be video, but it could be something else. It could be video plus something. I don't know. This is a premise is to say, well, we have a public broadcaster representative here. Of course, here in Europe, of course, the uh, public broadcasting systems are uh, asking themselves what their purpose is, mm -hmm. since we are there are no longer monopolies and so on. Uh, could be there could be a reason. Uh, uh, to think in terms of actually market failure. We see market failure in journalism everywhere right now, okay? Shouldn't we perhaps ask our public uh, funded media to think multimedially, not just videos, in terms of what the market cannot provide and provide it? And then the gentleman across the aisle. Um, thank you very much. I'm Peter Grester, both formerly BBC and Al Jazeera, uh, currently Al Jazeera. The 
question, it seems to me that, that we're dealing with technological changes that we just can't get a grip on. Um, it's impossible, we're flapping around in the middle of the sea without having any particular direction. It's almost as if we're trying to build a sandcastle in the middle of a rising tide. So I guess, and there are all of these contradictory influences, the need to make money, we have to make money to, to pay for journalism, but also the need to create quality, but also the need to work across multiple platforms. So this, the, the, the question really boils down to, do we have any sense about what it is that we're trying to produce, or we will be trying to produce in five or ten years' time? Do we have any idea what, what, what job, <laughs> what environment we're going to be working in, what platforms uh, we're going to be I producing mean, for? I think we, can, we need to wrap it up now for, for organization reasons, but I think very quickly, and I can say this because I don't work at a broadcaster, I can say the answer is no. No one knows what they're doing. <laughs> Um, but I think the, answer, the way to think about answering the question is to think about what are sectors in society where organizations are built to operate in changing environments of high uncertainty. And you can think about, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, which is dis where organizations are designed to simultaneously exploit existing market opportunities while constantly exploring and developing new products and experimenting. That's not the way in which media organizations have been run historically. Now, it's true, as you suggest, that the newspaper industry faced this problem earlier on and where we end the report is, I think, a way of, of, of sort of um, responding to your question. We end the report, Richard and I, by writing that we shouldn't be thinking about what will replace television news as we know it, because nothing will. We need to think about what, how can we move beyond television news as we know it, which is very much the exercise that the newspaper industry has already gone through and has reluctantly accepted that nothing will replace the print newspaper and profit of the 1990s and that great newspaper companies have to think about how they can use their human capital, their brand, their experience, their editorial qualities to do print journalism, yes, but also a whole lot of other sorts of journalism. And we basically suggest that broadcast organizations need to go through the same process, not because they know where they're heading, but because they know they have to change. With that, uh, thank you very much to our panelists, and thank you very much for all the questions and comments from the floor.